1 Timothy. So open up your Bibles to 1 Timothy. It's going to be a Bible study in throughout the book of 1 Timothy. If the Lord just wills, we'll go through 1 and 2 Timothy and maybe even Titus. So keep your pen, keep your paper, and we'll have a lesson on, on the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, go through the whole book. So let's go ahead and read this section um, that we're going to do tonight, 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 4. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of our God, of God our Savior, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some of them that there be that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fault to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. All right, that's where we're going to go to verse 4. Now, um, here we're going to study Timothy's, uh, the letter that Timothy received from the Apostle Paul. This is a letter by the Apostle who won him to Christ. So, Paul is writing a letter to his own, what he calls his son in the faith. And his son in the faith is uh, to him very precious, and his son in the faith is someone that he's trying to encourage and instruct. Now, Paul had a godly mother, I mean, uh, uh, Timothy had a godly mother and a godly grandmother, but we don't know much about his father. We don't know if he had a godly father or not, but Paul does set in order. Uh, for church doctrine and practice in this book. So this is a book to set things in order. Okay, now Paul is going to do some things here in this passage. He's going to greet. He's going to, uh, our, we're going to break this down in three points. Paul is going to greet the people, uh, greet Timothy. He's going to bless Timothy, and he's going to recommission Timothy. So that's how we'll break this down tonight. Paul's greeting to Timothy, Paul's blessing on Timothy and his recommission to Timothy. So let's look at Paul's greeting here in the first section where he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Uh, Paul says here that he is uh, greeting uh, Timothy as an apostle. Now, he doesn't need to state his credentials to Timothy because Timothy is a uh, uh, a friend, he's worked together with him, he knows Paul's credentials, but these credentials are stated for all the people that are going to, going to be uh, reading this book. It's going to be for all the people who are going to be affected by uh, Timothy's teaching, because they're going to see that Timothy has been ordained by the Apostle Paul to preach the gospel, and ordained of God, and is commissioned of God, and therefore this mention here of an apostle is written really for us. It's written for the people who Timothy was teaching. Um, Timothy knew good and well that Paul was an apostle, but he states his credentials. I'm getting up for Timothy again, but his apostleship, you notice it says, is of Jesus. It's of Jesus. Jesus himself commissioned the apostle Paul to preach. And so we find that Jesus being the um, the, the, um, the one who commissioned him gave Paul the authority, gave him great boldness as he preached. And really, everyone's uh, conversion is of Christ. Everybody who is saved comes to Christ through the working of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. And therefore, everyone can have great boldness because they've been called of Jesus Christ. If you're saved, Jesus called you. And when he called you, he called you for his purposes. And so you can have great boldness as you um, teach and preach and seek to uh, give the gospel, as you have opportunity to share with people. Remember that you have been called of Jesus Christ. Your commission is of Jesus Christ. Your conversion is of Jesus Christ. And then he says, by commandment of God. His doctrine was from God. And since his doctrine was from God, his doctrine was uh, approved of God. It was God's doctrine, and he was able with all authority to preach it. His doctrine was from God. What an important statement. His doctrine was from God. Ours must be too. 
Our doctrines must be from God. It's not acceptable to preach your opinions from the pulpit. It's not acceptable to preach your ideas or man's ideas or intelligent person's ideas. It is acceptable to preach the doctrines from God. So whatever God gives, that's what we have to preach. That's what we have to teach right from the Bible. Therefore, it's not acceptable for us to come to the pulpit and give you ideas that we've come up with. We need to give the doctrines that are from God. Paul got them from God. Paul gave them to Timothy, and Timothy preached them as well, and they wrote them down in this book so that we can learn God's doctrine. But also, he says that our hope is in Christ. Now turn over to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to see one other passage of Scripture that speaks of our hope. Colossians. Christ is our hope. Jesus is our hope. He said that our hope is in the Lord, and the Lord is our hope. We are looking for that blessed hope, the coming of Christ. And Paul is very full of hope, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Colossians chapter 1, it says in verse 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among you, the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ is our hope, and Christ in us is the hope of glory. He's our all in all. He's our all in all. Jesus is everything. When Paul writes, he says that he wants to uh, greet Timothy in the name of Christ, our hope. And Paul was filled with the hope of Christ. He was full of the love of Christ. He was full of the... Um, the power of Christ and Christ our Savior is our hope. When Jesus returns, we're going to enjoy the hope of our calling. We have Christ in us, Christ is our life, and our life is hid in God. So our life is hid with Christ in God. And since our life is hid with Christ in God, then our life is protected in Christ. Our life is a, a blessing in Christ. Our life is Jesus' life lived out in this world. We can't accomplish much. And God says, Jesus told us that without him, we can do nothing. Are you kidding? We can do nothing. And therefore, how are we going to get anything done if we can do nothing? We're going to have to have Jesus do something. And we're going to have to have him be our hope. So you need, we, we must learn what it is to have Jesus as our hope. Now, Paul did greet. He did greet the uh, Timothy, and he just greet him with these, these, sweet, these sweet words of uh, reminding him that uh, Christ was his hope. But then he blesses him. Look in verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. He says to him that, uh, he says unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. He's given give him a blessing. He's treating him as his own personal son in the faith. Now, obviously Paul led Timothy to the Lord. Tim Paul raised Timothy in the Lord. And Timothy was his own son. It is possible that Timothy's own father was not a saved man and his mother and grandmother were. It is possible that Paul found Timothy and raised him up in Christ and taught him all these things and became like a father to him in the absence of his own uh, spiritual father. And the, uh, the implications of that are powerful because I want you to think about the people that we can share the gospel with. And if you could understand the pain that they have had in their lives, if you could understand the hurt that they've had, people who have lost fathers, people who have had no father, people who have had a very wicked father, and if they were able to 
become saved through our influence, through our, um, our uh, connection with them, and by the power of Christ, then imagine the blessing for them to be able to say, this is my father in the faith. And it can work for mothers, too. There are women who have not had a mother in their life. They're, they became orphans when they were children, or they became uh, mother, motherless. There are ladies who have lost their mother at a young age, or they even, um, their mother abandoned them and never loved them, and they didn't know her. Maybe they were given up for adoption. Maybe they are in a foster home. Or maybe these ladies have had a wicked mother, a mother who did not love them and did not treat them right. Or maybe these ladies have had um, no spiritual mother in their life, and they, they've never had a, a woman to treat them with, with uh, spiritual affection and guide them in Christ. When you share the gospel with them as a woman, as a lady, as a, as a young child, you can become to them somewhat of a spiritual mother or spiritual influence in their life. When they get saved, they will look to you and say, This woman led me to Christ. This woman raised me in the faith. This woman taught me. And she, you will be to them the mother they never had. And you think about Timothy. Here he is. Maybe Paul was the father that he always wanted. The righteous man. The godly man. The man that led him to uh, faith in God. And to pursue on, uh, Christian, his Christianity. To pursue it with um, perseverance. To pursue it with uh, a high attainment. To pursue it with holiness and Paul was the one to do that and so what do we find we find that Paul was a spiritual father and God provided Timothy exactly what he needed Paul was the, the gap that was filled and of course what better blessing for Timothy than to have his father's blessing what better blessing for Timothy than to have the blessing of a father who was able to who's able to hear from his father, um, uh, "You are like a son to me," which is his his uh, message of "I'm proud of you. I'm I'm happy for you. Um, I am not. Uh, I'm trying to bless you." And so here Paul is able to say, "I'm like a father to you," and that's his blessing. You can't get a better blessing than to have your father's blessing. So God gave to Timothy something he wouldn't otherwise been able to have. So you can be a father to someone. You can be a mother to someone. You can be that person that they never had in their life because Christ used you to bring the gospel to them. Got half my notes upside down. Now, God's gifts are here blessed upon Timothy's grace, his mercy, and his peace. You see that in verse 2. God's uh, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace and mercy and peace. We have these wonderful blessings prayed upon Timothy. Grace, mercy, and peace. These are God's three greatest gifts that are poured out on men. Grace, mercy, and peace. The greatest gifts that God can give to man. Grace that represents, that is, that is his favor, the favor of God. The favor of God is his grace. It is his gifts, his divine blessing. Paul, Paul prays for this for Timothy, that he would have the divine favor. Mercy, he prays for mercy. That is the setting aside of punishment. Setting aside of punishment, setting aside of the evil determined on someone is mercy. When God gives mercy, He sets aside His judgment. He does that through Christ. He does that through Christ's death. He does that through overlooking sin and giving forgiveness of it and not punishing us for it. And then He prays for peace. Grace, mercy, and peace. The divine Peace is that divine presence in communion with God. Peace. Divine presence in communion with God. Peace is the divine presence and communion with God. That is what it is. It is, there's peace with God and there's the peace of God. Christ is our peace, the Bible says. So we have peace with God in Christ and we have the peace of God in Christ. Peace with God is when you no longer are um, 
Uh, when the peace with God is when you're no longer in rebellion against Him and you and God are walking together. And the peace of God is that communication of God's divine favor to you and, and your love perfected, the confidence that you have with God, the witness of the Holy Spirit that you're His child, that's the peace of God. The peace of God is that peace that is, it goes along with a very sweet fellowship. A sweet fellowship, that's the peace of God. So that's Paul's blessing. Paul's blessing was for um, to, to be able to say to Timothy, you're my son in the faith, and I'm giving you my blessing and, um, and praying these good things upon you. So then Paul recommissions Timothy. Look at verses 3 and 4. Verse 3 says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I was in, went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, that they have teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. So Paul recommissions Timothy. He says, Abide still. Abide still, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. He told him to keep doing what he had been doing. Keep going. He said, abide still. Abide still. Keep going. Doing, Keep doing what I told you. Now, all of us need a reminder sometimes to keep going and keep doing what you've been doing. Sometimes we get tired in the work. Sometimes we get have feel it's difficult. Sometimes we feel that uh, we are slowing down. Sometimes we feel that life becomes a burden. Or life is disheartening because we don't see certain results and certain uh, um, things coming to pass that we had hoped for. Our expectations begin to fail and we begin to wonder um, and we begin to be um, uh, tired under the burden that life presents us day after day after day. But Paul says, keep going. You're doing what I told you to do. Keep doing and remember what I said. This is a reminder and an encouragement which all of us need sometimes. You keep going in the faith. You keep going on for Christ. And you do it because God has told you. And because Paul says to his, his son, keep going. And you do it because you love the Lord and he's coming. Now notice uh, he says, I besought, besought thee to abide. This is Timothy's authority. It comes through Paul, but ultimately from God. Timothy had a great authority to preach as he preached in um, commission by Paul himself. The Apostle Paul gave Timothy this authority. He said, keep doing what I told you to do. So Paul's uh, commission gave Timothy terrific authority amongst the people as he went from person to person preaching. But every pastor has to be called of God. A pastor has authority because he's called of God. Now, when a pastor stands, Susan, when a pastor is called of God, he's called to preach the Bible, and he's called to preach the Bible in a um, in in the name of God, and so he has divine authority to do so, or to preach as the oracles of God, as the divinely revealed truth. We are to speak in God's presence, in His absence. Uh, we are to speak as commissioned by Him, as ambassadors for Him, and therefore every pastor needs to have this kind of authority. And of course they parted. They parted, but only for a time. Turn over to uh, chapter 4. <coughs> Look in chapter 4. Is the lights on? Go in your bedroom. This is the time to talk. First um, Timothy 4 9. Now, except that I was not supposed to put 4, but uh, I did it, especially 2 Timothy. I sent you to 1 Timothy. I just wrote down 4 9, but I know I'm not supposed to be in first Timothy. Excuse me. Paul, at the end of 2 Timothy, writes to Timothy, and he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. He said, Do thy diligence to come 
shortly unto me. So in, in our passage, he says, abide still at Ephesus. So pa Timothy is going to be the pastor at Ephesus, and he's going to appoint deacons, and he's going to appoint bishops, uh, elders, and he's going to be doing the work as an apostle. And Paul leaves him there, and they parted, but it's only for a time, because he says at the end of 2 Timothy, come quickly, come shortly unto me, do thy diligence to come. So even though they were best of friends, even though he was his son in the faith, even though he loved Timothy, he was willing to part with him for the work of God. But it was only for a short time. And then he came back, and they got back together. And so it's just a reminder to us that there are times when we have to part with friends. And we love them, but God brings them back. He brings them back because he loves us, and he wants us to be together. That doesn't always happen, but in this case it did. But there is a time when all of our friends will reunite. And you know when that time will be. The sweet by and by. Right? What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. And after I see Jesus, who am I going to see? I'm going to see my dad. I'm going to see my grandparents. People we love. It's a sweet thing to be a Christian. It's a sweet thing. Sometimes we part, but we get to come back. Sometimes it's in this life, sometimes the next. But the important thing is that we recognize that Paul was giving orders. He was giving orders to his son of faith, and it was Timothy's job to obey. Your job is to obey the orders given to you by your authority, by your parents, by your God. And why? Because if you do, then if there's a reunion to be happening, it's going to happen because you're obedient. Okay, now notice he says in verse 3, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. What a powerful statement, teach no other doctrine. There were many other doctrines being taught, and there are many other doctrines being taught, but they have, there's no warrant to teach something new. And as we've heard the statement, if it's new, what is it? It ain't what? If it's new, it ain't true. Right? You heard, have you ever heard this statement before? If it's new, it ain't true. And if it's true, it ain't new. The truth is not new. The truth is old. So in our culture, when all the new stuff is the favorite and all the old stuff is uh, to be cast out and despised, truth falls in the street as it's despised for the new thing. But we're not going to do that. We're not going to cast out the old doctrine to bring in the new doctrine. We're not going to water the doctrine down. We're going to try to preach it just as Paul preached it, just as it's preached to Timothy, and just as preachers have always preached it, because if it's new, it ain't true. And I want to know my doctrine comes from God, and that other good men have seen the same thing in the scriptures and have not lost important truth. We're not going to let it fall in the street. We're going to preach it. And we're going to preach it because it still is the power of God unto salvation. We are going to preach that, and we are going to see people saved with the gospel. The gospel as it's preached in the Bible. And we're not going to innovate. We're not going to be novel. And we're not going to bring in something new. Only God's doctrine is held by the church and stamped with his power ought to be taught. There is doctrine that is not stamped by the power of God. And there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with the doctrine that doesn't convert souls. And we need to be careful that we not, don't neglect the, the power part of our salvation, the power part of our gospel. The gospel as neglected, uh, the power as neglected in the gospel leaves a person without the ability to see Jesus save souls. Right? So, now, the Bible says, meddle not with those who are given to change. Meddle not with those who are given to change. And everybody should remember that verse. I didn't look up the reference, but I will. And you need to memorize that verse. Meddle not with those that are given to change. Everybody say it with me. Meddle not with those that are given to change. Now, why are you not meddle with those who are given to change? Because they will change you. And they like novelties. 
They like something new. Now what happens to people who like to change things and get something new? They don't like the things as they are. And Paul says, teach no other doctrine. Don't give me the people that meddle. Don't give me the people that change things. Don't give me the people that come up with something new. We want something old, something useful, something powerful, something soul-saving, something godly, something that makes me like Christ. Now, teach no other doctrine. True doctrine, we see here in this next verse. He says, he says, neither give heed. Neither give heed to fables, verse 4, and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. True doctrine produces godliness. True doctrine produces godliness. He says here that there's two kinds of doctrines. One which ministers questions rather than the true which gives godly edifying. That's the one that's in faith. That's the one that's in faith. The one that is ministers, not, not the one that ministers questions, but the one that ministers godly edifying. And so we are looking for divine revelation. We are looking for God's word, and we're looking to make sure we have understood it correctly. Well, what is the mark? What is the mark that God's word has been understood correctly? Well, the mark is godliness. The mark is the power to deliver from sin. The mark is the stamping of God's divine image on the man who holds the doctrine. That's the mark that the doctrine is true, and that is of God. It must conform us to God's image. That is the mark, that we're conformed to the image of God. It must be powerful. It must resist evil. We're looking for the doctrine that's true. How do you find true doctrine? The true doctrine produces godliness, not questions. The true doctrine must be fit for holy beings, okay. for angels, right. for the Lord, for Jesus Christ himself, for right. God our Father, right. and for people. It must be true to the nature of holy beings. That is God's revelation. It must be suitable to all people. And anyone in your station, anyone in your place in life should be able to say this, what, what, what is done here is correct. That's true doctrine. All lives and world, all, all lies and worldly philosophy and false theology produce ungodliness. There's ungodliness that's produced by them. They hold the truth in unrighteousness, and therefore they don't have true doctrine. There's false theology, and it produces ungodliness. What we will preach at this church is what leads to true godliness. That's what we're going to preach at this church. What leads to true godliness. What we're going to preach at this church is what leads to Christ's likeness. What we're going to preach at this church is what leads to self-denial. What we're going to preach at this church is Holy Spirit fullness and power. We're going to preach that. And we're going to preach it because that is the true doctrine and the only doctrine that leads to godliness. You can't be filled with you can't be godly unless you're filled with the Spirit of God. You can't be godly unless you're denying yourself. You can't be godly unless you're Christ like. Yeah. And you can't be godly unless you are seeking out the old paths and staying in them. You've got to seek out the old paths. That's true Christianity. This is the true faith. That's this is the true faith. And it is not but despised by many. And the reason it's despised by many is because it sets the person aside and elevates Jesus Christ, whom everyone says they want to elevate, but few really do. Everyone says they want to be like, but few really are. Everyone says that they want to emulate, and so few really glorify Christ. If you want to be godly, if you want to hold the true doctrine, you're going to have to have genuine faith that leads to more faith. What leads to more faith? According to the scripture, it says, rather, 
uh, uh, excuse me, it says, don't give heed to the fables and the endless genealogies which minister questions, rather godly edifying, which is in faith. Godly edifying is in faith. This is what leads to faith and leads to more faith. Godly edifying, building up to godliness. So throughout the book of Timothy, what we're going to find is that Paul is preaching and teaching Timothy what is sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. Sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. Sound doctrine leads to godly edifying. Sound doctrine produces godliness. And unless we have godliness then we don't have sound doctrine. And that is the message of 1 Timothy. That uh, what is the doctrines and practices of the church. So when we get through this study, you're going to have learned a lot about the practice of the church. What is to do, what is to believe, and how the church is to be run. Paul is writing to Timothy. And I hope that it will be a blessing to everyone. So our, con- in con- our concluding thoughts is this. you might be able to be a blessing to someone. You might be a blessing to someone if God will bless you through the power of Jesus Christ to be a spiritual father or mother to someone. And if you do, if you do have that spiritual blessing in your life, everybody look up here, you are going to have the ability to look back, you're going to have the privilege to look back and say, God blessed in my life with these people you may have to part with them but you will also be able to reunite with them and though you depart uh, though they may part and though you may reunite the great blessing is going to be to see the godliness in their lives and to see the godliness in your life and to see the godliness in your children to see the godliness in your loved ones as the true doctrine that produces godliness is preached from the pulpit of a real, of a good church, and the way church, the way the church, the way God intends it, and that's what we're going to attempt. That's what we're going to seek. That's what we're going to do at this church. We're not going to back down. We're not going to shy away. We're going to tell the truth. And our doctrine, if it doesn't produce godliness, then it's not a true doctrine. But if it does, then that's proof that God's stamp of power is upon it. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus. We're thankful for this book. It's an introductory message today where there's, a, there's such a great blessing to Timothy. Oh, Lord, that I'd be a blessing to someone's life. Lord, that I'd be a blessing as a spiritual father to, to, to someone again and again. Lord, lots of children are a blessing. We want to have lots of children. And we want to have lots of spiritual children, Lord. We want to see blessings over and over. And, Lord, I suppose there's no... Um, I suppose there's no, uh, um, it's, there's too obvious of a connection between the desire of people to have small families and people not concerned about having spiritual children. There's just not an interest in anything but ourselves anymore. Oh God, that we produce godly offspring, but oh God, that we produce godly spiritual offspring. Let the fruit, Lord, grow and let it glorify you because you love fruit that remains. So I pray for my children. I pray they'll be soul winners. I pray for my wife that she would have the privilege of leading people to Christ. And I pray that they would look to her as a spiritual mother and me as a spiritual father. Because, Lord Jesus, I want to see people saved. You've called me to the ministry to preach so that people get saved. And not so that I would do all the saving, but that you would use me to lead others to Christ and they would lead others to Christ and carry on the work of the ministry. Lord, use us to plant a church and plant a church, and plant a church, and grow up preachers for Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.